through life, you'll occasionally meet people who redefine a specific trait for you. This trait becomes embedded in the mental image you have of the person, and it intertwines itself in the words that they speak. There are many words that define Boogaloo, but the word that Boogaloo redefined is determination. I don't know if you felt the energy, everybody was working on it. I felt it. It feels like it's 2016 again and we're all ready. Yeah, yeah. 30 minute interviews. My bro, C Nut, rest in peace. I was walking to my house one day, and he was standing over here, like where the son Brown Lil Poe was at. I don't, I don't usually stay stand on the edge of the curve, you know what I mean? But he was telling me to come here. He was telling me some little foul shit was going on inside his phone. I guess you know the enemy niggas had. Uh, I guess the enemy niggas had um. Uh, they cracked into his phone, right? And they tried to set him up, you know, trying to sell him some weed or whatever. And he told me like, hey man, look at this shit, man. You think this shit weird? Hey, hop on this he tell me like, man, hey, look at my phone. This is when they had the little, little aim phones or whatever, right? So I, sidekicks, yeah, you feel me? So I look, I promise, I look both ways. And then I looked down at his phone, and I promise I looked up and he was standing right here. His face expression told me everything I needed to know. Plus prior to that, probably like five days, three days ago, I already done got shot at. So my nerves was already fucked up and bad, you feel me? I looked at his face and his face was like that. So I automatically hit the ground, but when I'm turning like this, I can just see the niggas in front of us. They was parked right here. Right, right. The whole time, and we not knowing, but they just dug down in the car, you feel what I'm saying? Whole time they parked right there. You feel what I'm saying? So, anyways, they pull up. They pull up or whatever. I turn around and I duck. When I'm turning around, I can see the nigga out the window with the fully. And I duck, like, right here, hit the ground. Boom, 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 boom. They shoot, like, probably like 28, 30 times. You feel what I'm saying? I got hit with them probably, like, the third shot. And when you on the ground and you hit, you thinking like, oh, blood, y'all can stop now. Y'all got me. You know what I mean? But it's not, that's not going to be the case. You feel what I'm saying? And my, home, uh, my bro Nut, rest in peace, he was running all the way back there in his fucking pants. His fucking pants fell about two or three times and they still didn't hit him. He fell because he's trying to get his fucking pants up or whatever. So anyways, long story short, I'm on the ground and I'm hitting the neck. The nigga... They driving off, and the niggas, the niggas say, hold on, cut, hold on, stop, 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 stop. So when I heard that, the nigga hopped out the car. He hopped out the car and tried to run up on me and finish me off. So he hopped off. So I'm right here. The nigga hops out the car, runs up right here, put the gun to me just like this, right? So I, I act like I bluffed him like I had something, like I'm trying to pull something out. So the nigga got nervous. He, boom. Boom, 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 boom. Run back into the car. When he got that close though, he just skipped me twice. But he had that shit, he had the gun at a nigga head the whole time. But you know, by the grace of God. Right. You know what I mean? A nigga still here though. Look, this is where I say that, right? And I was in a wheelchair, right? So, by me being in the wheelchair, hopping, Put this ramp right here for me, so I could be able to wheel my wheelchair in. So this is where you grew up at. So I grew up at Plum Line Up, right here. And you can still see in the door, that top right there. That's a bullet hole. Yeah, you know it was a bullet hole right there too. There's all type of bullet holes patched up and shit. Uh, what was it like to have to come outside of that every day? Made the nigga, made the nigga aware of your surroundings. You feel me? By being in the front, there wasn't no gate right here. So by being in the front, you can walk out and the nigga try to shoot you. You know what I mean? You walk into some shit, you don't know. If the homies just smacked on something, I mean, word ain't got back to you yet, some shit like that. So, uh, yeah, this is the front line right here, front line now.
So I don't we used to ditch school. We used to ditch school and come right here, the front line with our straps and shit, waiting on the enemies to come by and all that shit. We'll be up here till the morning all the way until my mama get off work. We'll see my mama pull it up and everybody you get to strike it. Oh God, that I go in the house and act like I was. I go in the house, act like one shit going on. She knew what was up. Got the front line right here though, man. For Born people, people don't who, re who don't really understand, we're talking about you coming outside every day prepared. For, yeah. for a shootout. Hell yeah. Because the gates was back there. Mm -hmm. So I was locked outside the gate. Because mm -hmm. the gate was right here. That gate, that was the gate. This, this shit in the front is some new shit. So, nigga, you on your own until you get inside that motherfucker. You feel me? Mm -hmm. So you, you basically locked out the gates. That's why I was called the front line. Because it's in front of the gates right here. The front line defense for the, the whole apartment. The defense, bro. Niggas used to ditch school all day. You come up here, front line. Dump on shit, chase cars down, all that shit. Then um, everybody used to go to school together too. We used to walk together. We meet up like right here. Then we'll walk all the way to Enterprise. And as we like crossing the street from Enterprise, we used to play this game called Chicken. And that's uh, when the car coming, you wait till that motherfucker like ten feet in front of you, and then you run out there without getting hit. <laughs> Young kids, nigga, doing crazy shit. We used to throw rocks at cars and shit. Nigga, they chase us. We'd run to the gates, get the big homies. You know what I mean? Do you think that there was a something that made you want to live more dangerously because you were already faced with that sort sense of danger every day? Probably so. It made it more exciting. It made it more wild. You feel what I'm saying? You can say that. You can say that. I used to put my strap up under here. Hide my shit. And most of the time, I used to have that motherfucking on because I don't, I don't, I don't agree with stashes and shit like that. Cause you got a stash in your car. It's a, it's good to have a stash, but I'm saying like, don't keep your gun inside your stash because if something happened, that shit happened like this, and you struggling to get it out of a stash. So this was my little spot, quote unquote stash, when I was in the front. But um, I stayed with that motherfucker on my hip though, because if somebody come through, it's like, it's like this. You feel me? Hell yeah, nigga, we up and no shit. One no one no getting no shots off at us in the front, but niggas was scared to drive down or something. Yeah. That shit made nigga way more active going up on the on the front line because that's that's twenty-four hours, fool. Twenty-four hours, nigga, you are in danger. You feel what I'm saying? So, coming outside to fucking meeting family members outside to bringing in your groceries to moms out here having big ass parties and all that shit nigga we, we right here holding this shit down holding so, this shit down normal everyday life but with intense danger 24 7 having to go to birthday parties do everyday regular stuff just like everybody else but meanwhile somebody's trying to Kill you. To kill you. Yeah. We used to play throw up tackle right here in the dirt. My uncles and shit, we'd be throwing the football for us. Uh, we'd throw it ourselves. What was the community like when you would play sports? Do you feel like you formed a lot of your lifelong friendships through that? Hell yeah, more like a family. Cartwright was just a worker. He was a worker, and I mean, that's why he was as good as he was. Still to this day, he's one of the best players I've ever played with, and that's going into the league. Uh, my name is Mike Evans. I'm the CEO and owner of Lakes Facts. And how did you meet Cooper? Man, way back, you know, we both played uh, Pop Warner at Carson. You know, he was a good teammate. I mean, some people can be good, but, you know, demean others mm -hmm. are, are kind of, you know, want the spotlight on, on them. But Carter was never like that. He never went and was, like, asking for the ball, even though he could have got the ball a hundred times and mm -hmm. scored a hundred times. That's <laughs> the talent he was. <laughs> but he was, he was a team player, and I think that's, that was kind of the backbone of most of our teams. I was, I was one of my best. That was the best coach I ever had, his pops, man. 
His pops was a real smart dude, man. Real what great dude. That you learned from him. The pops, man. Basically, the whole running, play, the whole running game. How I learned about football was through his pops. The the two hole, the four hole, the six, the one, the three, the four, all that. You know, his pops taught us in um, Evans. He was our defensive coach. You know, he had a lot of hands on with us as well. Them was the days that the coach say, hey, give it to Cartwright and get out the way. <laughs> get out the way. How your pops doing? Man, my dad is doing good, man. You know, um, every time, you know, we talk about you, you know, and he, he bring your name up to the kids. It's always, you know, a high level of, of excellence that he brought to the game, man. So, you know. When you hear the name Cartwright, what do you think of? Um, you know, for the position and, and what he did, like, you know, you think of like a hardworking kid. Uh, you think of somebody that brought passion and, and grind to the game. You know, he wasn't the biggest kid, you know, but, you know, he packed a big punch. You know, like I, I'm always used to being the hardest hitter on the team. And when, <laughs> when I say every time I hit with him, like I, I was chewing on my mouthpiece because my <laughs> shoulder was hurt. You know what I'm saying? I was, I was grinning on my mouthpiece, you know, because he definitely came with fire, you know, and that speed with the mental that he had, you know, was was definitely something that was, you know, worth talking about as, you know, we got older. Man, we had some good days, dog. We had some very good days, man. For what? For, you said five seasons you guys played together? At least five seasons, yeah. Yeah. My first year I played, um, I played with Randy. My yeah. first year, and then after that, all my other seasons, my, my seasons after that was with them. Mm-hmm. I must have been amazing to have Yeah, brothers, them. man, my brothers. It's been really interesting to get back, get you guys back together for these interviews and kind of see. Yeah, 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 yeah. Nothing's really changed. Everybody's, right, right, everybody's right. kind of still. The love is still the same, man. And you haven't really skipped a beat when it comes Basically, to Basically, yeah. And that's something you performed when you were younger in this field, on this field, right? Hell yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we grind. I mean, we had the, the hell weeks. Um, all the I mean, we just grind it, and since we did it year year after year after year, we just got accustomed to each other. I mm-hmm. mean, it was like a little brotherhood. I mm-hmm. mean, it was definitely. Like, like Carson told me. I mean, definitely. Like uh, you know, we kind of mentioned a little bit earlier. We we can not see each other for a long time, then we just click back and we just start going down memory lane. Mm-hmm. Um, because it was special. It was a special time because it was fun. I mean, it was it was when football was like truly, truly in essence, just fun, and we just got out there and played, and we just rooted for one another. It's safe to say you guys lived and breathed football, right? That's absolutely, it. That's absolutely. It. And as you can see, like you know, when even when we're not together all the time, us as adults, we all doing different things. When we come together, it's like, it's yeah, we don't miss a beat. You know, it was like it was yesterday being out there. You know, it was no jealousy. You know, when a person scored, like, this was my brother scoring. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like, and that's what it's about, you know? And, you know, I think that's what helps, you know, us continue to grow and be able to help the next generation and, you know, be successful in what we do. Do you feel like a lot of the tools that helped you succeed later in life, you learned on that field when you were younger? Yeah, and I think a big thing was I was fortunate enough to have my dad as a, as a coach. Mm-hmm. And, uh, Good dude, man. Good and dude. he really drilled in uh, work ethic. And sometimes I just, like, deep down try to come back and, and think about a lot of those things that he taught us because I'm starting to help out and coach my sons, too. And because uh, my dad wasn't a yeller. He never tried yeah, to put anybody like, down, but mm-hmm. for some reason, he always got the best out of people. And uh, Facts. and so that's something that I just always learned and appreciated because when I got older, uh, uh, most coaches weren't like that. You know, I didn't have my dad around. You feel me? I had Big Bull, but you know, ain't nothing like, you know, your own dad, man. You know, I don't have my dad to pass on things or teach me this or show me that. So, you know, your coaches is like your, your second parent, you know what I mean? Your coaches is people that you could talk to. I mean, I spent the night over coach's house, you know what I mean? And wake up game day, ready to go, you know what I mean? And and a, a good thing about Carson too, man, there wasn't a lot of coaches out there just talking crazy to the kids, just all reckless and shit, like how like, it was in high school and other places. They wasn't doing that, man. It was more 
more of a family. You know, they didn't have to do that. I ain't gonna say they wasn't strict or didn't want discipline, but they they did they went about it a certain way that a lot of coaches don't go about it. You know, mm-hmm. nigga ain't putting your motherfucking pride down, or, you know, embarrassing you, or none of that. You know what I mean? It's the regular discipline, but it wasn't like it wasn't overboard discipline. You know, and I appreciated that. Now, what point was it where you stopped playing football? Um. When I had got And what was that like for you, having to lose your brother on the field? I mean, that was that was big, man. I, I still remember, you know, going to go see him, yeah, you know, and, and you know, like it hurt. You know what I'm saying? I still get I get emotional now, knowing you know that you know that happened. You know what I'm saying? I get chills talking about it. You know because he was there. You know. You seen how far you seen that athlete, you know what I mean? And then just to see your dog not even being able to stand up no more. And this was a good friend of mine, you know what I'm saying? Besides the athletic, yeah, yeah. you know, things that he did on the field, it was my brother. It hurt me so bad because I knew how talented and I knew how much he worked. And, um, so that's why it was just so unfortunate. Um, and it was it was early, was it ninth or tenth grade? It was Man, that was probably uh tenth grade, yeah. Yeah, because I knew it was early. We had so like two be, two or three months of tenth grade, yeah. Yeah, because I was like you didn't even like get a chance. I didn't even get a chance in, to play high in, school. In high bro. school. Just being paralyzed, you know, um it's more of a the end of the road of football for me, you know, because to say if, you know, going down the other road, game banking and all that, at any moment, you can get yourself together and, and you know what I mean, go on the right path and then, oh, you know what, man, this shit bullshit. It's only two ways to this death or jail. You know, I'm going to get my life together. I'm, you know what I mean? I'm going to get back. I'm going to get back in shape and I'm going to start back playing football. But when you get shot and paralyzed, it, it ain't no, you know what I mean? Your options is over with as far as football. You know what I mean? I never had that option to get myself back on the right path and get myself back into football, you know, so. Yeah, it, it, it was heavy. It was heavy. And then, you know, I started rooting from, for the people that I played with. You know, I seen him in the right path and I seen um, Mike Evans. He was he was at Louisville. Did he go? Mm-hmm. He was playing playing college ball. So you know, automatically, I'm rooting for them because we came from the same area. We came from the same stomping grounds. You know what I mean? And you know, if you if you see them do it, you know you could have did it. You know what I mean? You know you could have been in that position. You know that it was a hard pill to swallow, but you know um, I had to come to grips with it. You know what I mean? And I had to. Uh, Come to grips with it and realize, all right, this this is what's going on. This is what didn't happen. I mean, I gotta I, I gotta accept it. I definitely it definitely was was hard to watch. You know, hard to watch at a, somewhere that you know that you could have been. You know, definitely. And that that gives me a little understanding of how you felt at the time. Just even. Uh, hearing this news and that that would have been heartbreaking because you got to see firsthand for five or uh, four or five seasons mm-hmm. exactly how talented and um, good he was on the field. So you knew what was lost at that moment. Oh yeah, I mean because I mean it was no doubt that he would have got a scholarship somewhere. It was no doubt about it, and, and it might not even been running back. It could have been corner. It mm-hmm. could have been something else because he was just talented and he 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 worked hard. I mean, the story we said how he broke his, his arm, missed the whole season, but stayed with it, mm-hmm. and then came back in the playoffs and played for us. I don't know too many people that would do that. People just chalked it up and just said, oh, well, I'll just wait till next season. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, that just tells you a lot about it. So, yeah, it was, it was, I mean, me and my dad, I mean, we were just devastated. What I did was put all that into getting out that chair. You know, I started... I started um, exercising, you know. I started um, going to the to the pools, doing the water therapy. 
the water therapy is really what got me out of the wheelchair. Yeah, my name is Mike Webb, a.k.a. Big Bat, Captain Elkport. Well, I wanted to ask you a few questions about what Boogaloo was like when he was growing up. Oh, man, he was a great kid, man, great athlete, you know, high energy, very outgoing, you know, real special. His confidence level was, you know, to the roof, man. <laughs> he was an outgoing kid. You know, very confident, like I said, great athlete. Mm -hmm. He just had this energy about him that it attracted people. So I used to steam around and I said, man, this, this dude right here, he gonna be something. But when that thing happened to him, he, you know, that was a tragedy, but I know he had a lot of, he had a lot of energy in him and, he, and that wasn't gonna be the end of it. Mm. And he told me that, that you were one of the individuals who helped him out and took him to physical therapy at the pool and stuff. Is that right? Oh, yeah, man. That's true because, like I said, I just saw something on body where he had this energy and this magnetism where we couldn't let that be the end of it, man. Hmm. You know, I've, I've seen a lot of homeboys get put in that chair and they kind of, like, give up. Yeah. He didn't have that look. You know, he had that look like, man... Something else got to give. This can't be it. Mm. And I felt like I was in a position where I could at least try to do something to help him. Because, you know, my little homies, man, I love all of them. Is there anything that you felt like you had to say? Or did, or did you feel like he already had that motivation inside of him? Like, did you feel like you had to encourage him oh, at all? Oh, definitely. He already had it. Okay. That's why, you know... I felt confident just even shooting the idea to him because I knew he'd be for it. Hmm. Like I said, I knew that wasn't the end for him, man. He, he had to do something about it. He, was, he had too much energy. Man, we was going to the... Before he got the chair, he had too much energy. Oh, Bond, we was going to the, to the YMCA. We was just walking in that motherfucker. Just walking in that bitch. Did you say something about oh, that? Uh, you knew somebody yeah, up there? Oh, yeah. My son, Kyrie, used to go to the school up there when he was like in... In the garden, so you know I used to be up there every day. I know the teachers and all that stuff, but I didn't really know all the people, you know, over the pool area. But I know we had, hey, the homie needs the pool. We get in there, and we wasn't asking no questions, man. Hell no, nah. <laughs> hell no. Nah. Uh, forgiveness and for permission. <laughs> yeah, we 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 rocked it for a long time, man, until they got tired of it. Like. What you said, man, we got a little too deep. The homie, everybody wanted to be a part of it. That's what happened, man. And, you know, it wasn't like we was going to turn nobody down trying to help out. But they wasn't seeing it that way. Hey, but we, we got what we needed up out of it, right? Hell yeah. We jugged their ass. Hell yeah. After that, I started going to the T-Bone. I started, I had the T-Bone open the uh, the park pool up. They was letting me we'll go up in that motherfucker, walking up and down the shit. Swimming and all that shit, so I was still bull, you know. Hell yeah, I'm glad it all worked out though, man. I was determined to help you get up out that chair. Man, you was, dog. You was, and you played a real vivid part in me getting up out that motherfucker. I used to play horse in my wheelchair. Yeah. I'm about to do little tricks in that motherfucker. Yeah, I used to do these little tricks on it, and then I sit on the bench. Somebody put me on the bench to hold me up, and somebody else would get on the wheelchair, and then I have to. Mimic the same trick that I just did. Niggas used to be falling out that motherfucker. I put my uncle in the heat drunk set. We get him trying to play horse with the motherfucking wheelchair. He falling, we laughing. So we made the best of it. You know, I, I really didn't have no time to, to be depressed and all that shit. Like, you know what I mean? We still had love over here. And, you know what I mean? I had motherfuckers helping me. Motherfuckers looking out and shit. Then at the same time, I always had the mindset. I was gonna walk. You know what I mean? I was gonna figure that shit out. It was a lot of like older people. Sometimes they'll see me drinking and doing the most of shit. They was thinking I was giving up, but they didn't know. Like every morning, people still coming to get me. I'm walking with my with my motherfucking braces. I'm, I'm, I'm at the pool across the street. Or I'm at the YMC with the with the back. You know what I mean? Niggas was exercising. I, I, I ain't gonna. I'm admit though, the whole time they got smoked and drink. The whole time, but I, I gotta bump that motherfucker. Yeah. From your perspective, though, what was it like to see him really getting up every day and getting at it, really working at it? That shit just 
think about it, shit, from, you feel me, we young, we doing that. I remember when he got to driving and shit, it's like, <laughs> shit, we look back, like, you feel me? Doing everything we doing, shit. Me and Bugs, the sock niggas up together, you feel me? When he barely walking, shit. Do you remember I rush somebody, he, when they sit down, sat on the bench, he get up on him and sock him too, like, shit. That shit didn't stop nothing. I used to drive with, I still do, I drive with two He always had that like, not even just him, that's like us around here. We don't, we don't, we don't get no hard time humble us. Like we, we done been through it all so. It's like he said, even though people used to see what we doing, gang banging and all that, he's still doing what he was doing. Like if you know, niggas had that, that come from within, like that inner drive. It ain't like something somebody gotta make him do. That shit came from wanting to get back to walking and doing all that type of shit. What was it like to be able to have people like that and a lot of other friends you had around supporting you? Man, that was everything, man. And it wasn't, I, I didn't even have like no no room for depression or no shit like that because I had a whole lot of love for family and homies, you feel what I'm saying? And my homies, a lot of my homies is closer to me than my own family, you feel what I'm saying? It's like I was saying, people was knocking on the door, at my door, telling me, come on, let's go, let's, let's go walk for the day. And I do that shit in the morning, walk up and down the street, and then throughout the day, I'm you know I'm doing what I'm doing. But every day a nigga a nigga worked out, man. And hell yeah, I'm I'm, I'm just I'm just glad I'm from the area that I'm that I'm from because watching these niggas, man, is watching them when we was young made us to the people that we are today. Real shit. <laughs> I appreciate that, man. Yeah, he come from that era, man, where losing wasn't an option for us. Yeah, man. We always been the underdog, you know. He come up in that era where he saw we press forward. He press forward. He keeps pushing. Always determined and persistent to succeed. You know, that's what life is about. When they count you out, you always prove different. Boogie's taking me back to Rancho Los Amigos, which is the hospital where he spent most of his rehabilitation. We up here at my old uh, hospital office, and um, we just go, we just go walk in this motherfucker and just act like I'm still here, and we go get as much footage as we can in this bitch. So let's see if we can uh, fool these motherfuckers. Right here. Yeah, it's, it, we go get to the middle of it. All this shit is just like other shit that they got going on. This motherfucker is big as hell. Make it right right here. This is the best wheelchair hospital in California. Probably in the world. Look how big this motherfucker is. I mean, here they teach you how to, uh, if you fall out your wheelchair, they teach you how to get back in that motherfucker. They teach you if you need to get up like bumps and heels and you know how to lift your shit up you know what i mean they teach you all basically all the fundamentals getting you ready to even be in a wheelchair you know that they use. You see how they got things sitting down that people can move and you see that little that little long walking thing here or whatever. Mm -hmm. They would they would put these forest gum braces on me, right? And then you know that should be moving. That should hold your legs straight. So it really ain't you standing up. It's the braces standing up, right? So basically you hold on to that to that to that walker thing looking type and you move your legs like, like kind of like, <clears throat> you know what I mean? Like moving your, your legs with your thigh muscle because your calf muscles don't work, you know what I mean? So it's like you moving kind of funny, like oh, this, this, is, this is me, this is my legs. <clears throat> you know what I mean? You keep doing that shit every day until 
the muscles start building up in your calves now, you know? So, yeah, man. They got a lot of shit for you to, like, sit down on. And you can you can push your leg, like, to, to ride some shit. You know what I mean? Like this. You can push your leg, and that shit will, will, will turn into a day you ain't even pushing it no more. Now what's going on? You feel what I'm saying? As long as that you can show any type of improvement, nigga, you got to run with that shit. Your muscles and nerve, you know, that's a different, that's a different ball game. That shit get the shriveling up and, and you quitting and all that shit. You ain't gonna have no chance. You know what I mean? You do the best. You have the best chance when you, when after you get shot, like uh, uh, immediately. You know, you don't, you don't wait years to try to make it happen. Your overall memories of physical therapy. How would you rate them? Good. Bad. Bad, man. You know, that's kind of like um, football hell week, right? You know, you're doing all that conditioning and all that shit. That shit hurt. That shit is stressful. You know what I mean? It's hard. That's how that shit was with, with physical therapy, trying to walk again and all that shit. That shit wasn't easy, man. That shit was hard as fuck. So you every day constantly doing that shit, and there's, and there's people in your ear telling you to stay motivated, you know, keep going. And in your, in your mind, you like, man, shut the fuck up. Like, you don't, you don't know what it's like to go through this. You, don't, you ain't in my shoes. Trust me, you do not understand, you know? They don't, they don't mean no harm, but it, it, it does get irritated sometimes. You know, this was a, this was a long journey. show you what was my improvement it was times when I was in the in the bed and I could not move my legs at all literally at all and then working with the therapists and shit like probably like after a month I was able to to move my legs just a little bit like you feel what I'm saying but me seeing that my legs was moving just a little bit knew that okay I can improve if I stay at this shit and keep doing it Nigga, I'd be walking again. You feel me? So I, I, once I seen that, I ran with it. And then after that, it became more so of a mind thing. You know, it was days that I didn't know if I was going to walk again or how I was going to walk again. But I just kept telling everybody, and I, t and, I, and I psyched my mind out, like, I'm going to walk again. You know what I mean? I'm going to walk again. <sighs> to the point that shit actually really ended up happening. That's why I, was, I respect that quote, mind over matter, man. It was shit. Some rain. And uh, I've been talking with Boogaloo for the full day today, and uh, you know, five years at this point, really. And mm -hmm. lucky to say I've learned a lot about him. And um, I was just curious, what was he like when he was growing up? Oh my God, he um, he was more so. He was the kid that you would never think would do anything wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> He was that kid that nobody believed if he ever got in trouble because he just wowed everyone that he came across. My daughter has been the same way. Yeah, she really is. Yeah. She looks so innocent. And we was talking about, um, I was telling him about when you know, I was in the, the ambulance, right? And we pulled up to the hospital. I was telling everybody, I'm like, man, I don't know how my mama got in the back. I don't know how she got past security. I don't know how she was in the in the ER when the when the people put you on the gang and pulling you in. She was right there. 
you know, she, she I don't was, even know how I ended up there. It was it was a dark day for me. It yeah. was it was very dark. Um <clears throat> I just I happened to look to the left and I seen my son on the gurney going in the in the elevator. So I I slipped in there too. What was that you phone know? call like when when I got the phone call? What was you doing? You know, I was putting Anaya down because you know your sister was a baby. Mm-hmm. She was maybe about nine months. No, she was a year. She was a year. <clears throat> she you guys had just left the house. I was putting her to bed and I got the phone call. When I got the phone call, I screamed so loud to Jasper was walking by Mm -hmm. and she came to the door. Mama, what's wrong? Mm -hmm. And I told her you had just got shot. So she took it from there, you know, and and, and I called. She drove you to the hospital? No, she called. She she went in the gate. She let everybody know. Um, I called Auntie Flo because I Mm -hmm. didn't want to alarm Granny. So I called Auntie Flo, and she went to my mother's house and knocked on her door to let her know what happened. Um, Jasper went all the way over there? No, mm-hmm. Auntie Flo, because I called oh, Auntie, Auntie Flo. Auntie Flo to Granny house. Yeah, to mm-hmm. knock on the door to let her know that you had just got shot. And um, to tell you the truth, I, I don't know if Jasper or um, Big CK, I don't know mm-hmm. if one of them drove me to the hospital. I can't remember who drove me, mm-hmm. but I know I ended up there. Mm. You know, I can't remember who who drove me, but I know I ended up there. Um, That that whole day was just strange. Believe it or not, every time I ever been shot, I felt it. Like, the morning. Like, when when I get up and I'm putting on my shoes, it's just like some type of funny feeling. You feel what I'm saying? Little things that go on through the day, and I'd be like, oh, well, that's what it was. Right. And it's never like that. It's right. it's a second something else later on in that day. Yeah. It's yeah. crazy. I felt it every single time before I got shot. I felt it when I was tying my shoes that morning. It was just like an odd just an odd feeling I got. So right. when we when I did get to the to the hospital or whatever, you remember you was pulling off my chains and yeah. stuff. So and they was telling me, Ma'am, you can't do that. You you gotta you can't touch him, ma'am, you gotta I'm like, this is my fucking son. What do you mean I can't touch him? So I'm taking his necklace off and, you know, I'm kissing him and telling him I love him. Because at this mm-hmm. point, I don't know what's going on. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't I don't know what stage you're in. You know, you, you mama, you know, and I'm just holding you and I'm crying, you know, and they mm-hmm. pulling me off of you. And so, you know, they took me into the waiting area. And next thing you know, they, they came out and they told me that he was going to be paralyzed. Mm-hmm. Mm. So when they said that, I fainted. So I end up getting admitted. You know. Cause that's crazy from somebody going from like football star, track star, to the next day you can't even stand on your own two legs. You can't even like, stand on his own two legs. You know, it was real devastating for me as a mom to know, you know, my baby is never gonna walk again. You know what I mean? So it was very heartful to where I, I passed out myself, you know, and they told me, you know, ma'am, you have to get it together. We're not going to let you see him. So the strong woman that I am, I have to pull it together. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. For him, yeah. because yeah. you can't tell me I can't see my baby. Right. You know what I mean? So I was in the waiting room. Oh, my God. The waiting was room was like? crazy. It, it was like no walking room. It was no walking room in the waiting room because everybody was in there waiting, you know what I mean? And that was the longest wait of my life, you know, that my, um, excuse me, y'all. It's okay, mom. Get it out. Get it out. <clears throat> it was just the fact that, you know, you playing football, all the dreams that you had, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? and. You play football to where you was untouchable. You know what I mean. You can you can come out of a hole so quick and make a touchdown. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. and and to just see all that flash to where he can't do that anymore. You know, I didn't even have the love to even watch football no more because yeah. I felt like I needed to be watching my son. My son is the one we should be caring up for. Mm-hmm. You know, so that 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 really you know was was hard to swallow at that time. 
I lost out. I lost out on like playing football as well after, like meaning, I didn't want to watch football no more neither. Yeah. For some reason, after after what happened to me, I I was not into football as much as I was at first. You wasn't. You didn't even you like people who it. can walk. Yeah, you hated I, you know, everybody that knew how to walk. Yeah, I went through some <laughs> shit. Like, yeah, you hated everybody who knew how to walk. You cussed people yeah. out for walking. Yeah, I remember that. <laughs> My mind was different back then. Yeah, it was. Man. It was different, you know, and the transition that you had to go through, and to see him be so determined at night. I heard this noise one night, you know, when he was home, and it was like, what is that? You know, I thought somebody broke in. But he had tied cereal boxes to his legs. He oh, was trying to walk. Stop him from hitting each other. <laughs> he didn't uh, want his legs to, because they didn't have any control, and they would go like this. So he tied the boxes to his legs to keep them from hitting each other. You know. So basically, when I got home, I had to, I had to crawl like a baby. Like I yeah. had to really like yeah. learn how to walk again. So I would crawl around, around the, the house. house. Then I get to the hallway and I try to stand up. But I'm holding on to each wall. But when I'm moving, my legs is going that way, that way. I have no control over the leg. Then I couldn't control them because they, they still paralyzed. So they moving this way, yeah. moving that way. I'm just now starting to like get a little movement and muscle and all that. Little shit like that I was doing to just, you know, try to try to get back on my feet. You know, and all I all I really needed was to see that uh, I can I can progress. You feel mm -hmm. me? Because it was a time to where I wasn't able to move my legs at all until it came to a time where my, my foot started, my foot and my toes started being able to move and yeah. just little stuff. Once I seen that that something was able to move, something was able to, uh, any type of little progress, I knew if I stayed on it, I'd get much better, you yeah. know what I mean? Your strength. But I had to stay consistent, you know what I mean? And you did it. And then, you know, when you sitting down, laying down for about Four months, then you go to a wheelchair hospital and they, they put you on some on a machine that lifts you up. It's not you standing up, it's the machine. As soon as you stand up for the first time in like four months on this machine, you're dizzy. You know what I mean? You, you, there's blood coming out your nose. And they was telling me it was normal. You feel what I'm saying? But that that's the only time I probably thought to myself, like, damn, how the fuck am I walking? If I can't even stand up on this machine without without getting dizzy. You feel what I'm saying? So that was right. the only time. Then after that, I don't know, man. I, 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 I shifted. I put it in my head. Fuck that. I'm walking again. Yeah. I'm walking again. I'm walking again. Crutches, um, it was a cane, the, a, um, the little it was, chair, the little roll away. Yeah, it was um, the walker, walker the, crutches, cane to nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Was that was man. another thing too. Like, you know, I had a lot of like, um, Females that came to the hospital. Auntie Mary wanted like <laughs> all your females to touch you, make sure you was yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, that too. <laughs> so I, I had a lot of females, female love, you know what I mean? And, she said, let know. them in there, sis. Let them all in there. Yeah, you got they, to see. They would push me around the hospital and stuff, and they stilettos and stuff. And yeah, I, I had a whole lot of love from, like, females and shit like that. You know, I was young, player, you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, Around it was... Time, so. It was a, a very hard time of time because to watch your son just go through the pain, you just want to take it away. Yeah, you definitely. know what I mean? He was crawling. My daughter was crawling. You know, yeah. it's like I got two kids just learning how to walk together at the same time, you know. And she didn't understand because she was one at the time, you know, so... He just thought getting on his back was something that he was doing that was fun for him. Right. You right. know? So just the fact of, of seeing that and not being able to take that pain, you know, it, it, it just, it tears you down. You know, you be strong as much as you can, but at some point, you know, you break, you know? That nerve pain, that nerve pain is something different. Them spasms and to shit. see his legs jump off the Spasm. bed, you know, Spasm he jumps grab, so high. It grabs your muscle, and I still go through them to this day. I mean, people in wheelchairs, they go through spasms too as well. People that are stuck in wheelchairs. It's the thing that they, they let it get to like bouncing and shit. Then you got to do some little shit to, to get it to stop. The only thing is they can't feel it. You know what I mean? But by me getting my feeling back, 
with most of my feeling back. I could feel them spasms, and I still go through. You that remember shit when the doctor used to touch the bed and you used to tell them to stop, and yeah. they told you you was paralyzed and you couldn't yeah. feel it. Yeah, yeah. He even made a nurse cry one night. She uh, went to give him some medication, mm-hmm. remembering she couldn't tell you what she was giving you. And you told her to get the fuck up out your room. And they called me at 3 o'clock in the morning. Yeah, man. <laughs> they, they called me at 3 o'clock in the morning. He won't take his medicine. And it was the black nurse, the young nurse. She said, no, he did what he was supposed to do. Yeah, You're supposed to be able that. to tell your patient what they taking. That's real shit. I remember nights up in there too, man. It was uh, like my, uh, I was about to say Sally. You know how fucked up my mind is. The, the nigga who was next to me. The Hispanic <laughs> the guy. Hispanic guy, man. From the valley. At nighttime, the nigga used to be like smacking his legs and trying to hit him. Just trying to feel some, but couldn't feel shit, you know? And he didn't really have that much support. You know, I had a lot of support, man. I was, I was, in, I was in there eating. Red Lobster, yeah, we fed Roscoe's, Bates Fish. Yeah. yeah. That love right there, you know, being in that type of situation was everything. I remember going to um, going to Disneyland, do like old motherfuckers and shit, and they used to like donate to the hospital. And we'd go to like Disneyland to certain places and be like a, a Mexican nigga. He had the electric wheelchair. So we were all, we were all, uh, Connect to his with our hands, and it'd be like a train going through Disneyland, and we going through, we slapping shit out of people's hands and shit, man. I had some fun times there, and some fucked up times too. I remember one nigga, man, he couldn't even, he couldn't move his arms or nothing. The black guy. Yeah, he and had his, he had to stare with thing. the wheelchair. Yeah, staring with the thing. You know, came that, in end my room. Being, that ended up being my doctor's son. Oh yeah. Yeah. Man, that nigga came in the room. He seen, I think it was a, a winter formal post, a winter formal picture or something, but I had a red hat on. He came in my room. He, he was from 60s. I don't know where. I thought he was from Broadway. Or no, he was from 60s. Nigga doing this shit or whatever, trying to, uh, he, he, he doing this shit, maneuvering with the wheelchair. He come in my room, he look at the shit, and he go, is you a block? And I said, yeah. He said, <laughs> he drove out the motherfucker all mad as shit, man. I said, I can't get a break nowhere. We had a pediatric unit. This nigga mad. Man. Beat it, man. Beat it. Real quick, I want to jump in. How were you able to stay strong and, and uh, really be able to support him during the hardest times? My support system. My mom was my rock. Granny. My mother was the one who set that foundation to um, hold me up. You know, not only her, but family. I had a lot of family that just was there for the support, you know. Auntie Flo, she stayed, stayed going, you know what I mean? She stayed. Auntie um, Flo and Chewy stayed. Yeah, my brother Chewy, my brother, he did the night shift because my baby, she was young. She was only one when he got shot. So my brother would stay at night with him every night because we didn't want him to be alone. And he didn't want to be alone, you know, because this situation right here is scary. So my brother stayed at the hospital every single night. You know, so that gave me my peace to where I knew somebody was there that would be if he woke up, if he needed anything. You know, we we didn't trust it. You know what I mean? So you never know who who can come into the hospital and do anything, you know. But by him being there, that was me being able to to rest, you know. Um, My mom, you know, again, anytime in the middle of the night, he's having a bad night, we hopping up and we're going. You know what I mean? I didn't trust people keeping my daughter. So with my mom and my brother being my support system, the way that they were, it helped me on days that, you know, if it was the middle of the night type of situation, they would be there and they would take care of that, you know. That must have been unbelievably helpful to have people. Yes. Yes. Johnny, you over there crying, man. (laughs) Not yet. It's coming, though. I'm trying to be strong and hold it, but, you know, I I wouldn't wish that on no one, you know, and and not to be personal with it, but, you know, he in a pamper, you know, he was in a pamper, my daughter was in a pamper, 
You know what I mean? Just just imagine. And at the same time, I'm going to school to be a medical biller. Mm-hmm. So I still have to maintain that and be there for my son at the same time and raise my daughter. So I couldn't do nothing but be a superwoman. I couldn't fold because it's not in my blood. Never folded. Never folded. You know, I, I couldn't. The only thing I, I could do was to be strong because if I fold, he was going to fold. I had to let him know that we, we got this. You got to be strong. We got this. Cuss, fuss, do whatever it is you got to do, but we not giving up. I always knew I was going to walk again, man. That's he did. He told the doctors when they told him that he wasn't, he told me, he said, bitch, you a lie. Get your ass out of here with that negativity. I always knew. <laughs> We were in the apartments yesterday to shoot a video for Mari Ruger. No, we just need a body bar. After the shoot, game, Boogie, game. Infant, Picasso, Faux Peas, and Hilt were in the apartments hanging out when Boogie took this video. Unfortunately, Faux Peas was killed only hours after this video was taken. We lost a beloved member of the Rose Prince team. Four Peas was genuine. He was supportive. And above all, he loved his homies and his family. This project is dedicated to Four Peas. Bugaloo is an individual I feel is capable of speaking to Los Angeles as a whole. And I also believe that Bugaloo is somebody you want to listen to when he speaks. He's somebody who's seen everything and been through everything. Not only do I feel he is capable of speaking to Los Angeles as a whole, I feel Los Angeles has a lot it can learn from Bugaloo. I've, I've been in there until where a nigga just got life, nigga, and he come out the motherfucking, come out the courtroom, nigga, and you, know, you look at that motherfucker and it's like looking through a fucking ghost. You feel what I'm saying? Looking through a straight ghost, nigga just lost his motherfucking life. I've been in that position. I knew God put me in that position to see shit like that and take that back to where I come from. And, 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 and put that motivation in my niggas to never be in that situation. I'm, I'm not the type to ever go uh, tell a nigga to go on a motherfucking mission. You know what I mean? Go smoke this nigga, I go smoke that nigga. That I know will put them in jail. I put them in, in harm's way. That you ain't no real big homie if you do some shit like that, nigga. Right. You ain't no real big homie, nigga. That's, you, you supposed to want better for your little homies, nigga. You don't want them to go through the shit that you done seen. Like I've seen, you know, I'm a little older, so I've seen generations, the generations also of I shit. Grew up with the older. Group. I grew up with the older. You know what I mean? I've seen generations. I seen niggas that I can see like, ooh, the way he acting. Well, I got something to prove. Okay, he gonna end up getting life all the way. That nigga moving, not paying attention, thinking he tough. Ooh, somebody will get end up killing that nigga. Like you, you can see it. You can see it because you've seen it before. So I would do anything to my young niggas for them not to go through that. Even if it gotta be a, a nigga like, oh man, he, he, he want peace now, or he trying to, he, he trying to, uh, what do they call it, peace cheating, all that shit. Man, I, I don't give a fuck about none of that. If I can, if I can save the young nigga from, from, from the shit that I know will happen to him, they call me whatever. Any nigga that know me, and been around me, know the deal. That's why everybody that's around me respect it. You gotta understand how wild I was to understand the person that I am now. And all that shit when niggas be talking about that peace street shit or whatever, a lot of niggas that, that have a problem with it, there's a lot of niggas that ain't never even did shit. A lot of niggas that ain't never even put no gun in their hand and uh, went 
went to go squeeze or some shit. Most of the 80%, 90% be them type of niggas. They never did a motherfucking thing. Cause they they don't they ain't come from that like they don't know what this shit really like. The niggas that the really know what this shit right. really like, they with that shit. They with that shit. Cause they don't want anybody else to go through. They don't want anybody else to go through what the fuck they did. That's a real nigga right there. You're preserving your neighborhood. I was proud of him because, you know, I lost many nights of sleep. Many nights of sleep behind him and his craziness. And I didn't know where it came from. He had to be like that. He wasn't raised like that. But, you know, shit happens. But um, I was so proud of him. I was very proud of him. Actually, in my, yes, in my bedroom above my, my head where I sleep, it's the newspaper of, you know, of that, of, of when he did that. Then there's another one in the garage as well. But um, I, I was proud. You know, I was like, come sign this. You know, yeah, I, wanted, I wanted his autograph. You know, even though you're my son, I need your autograph on this. Love you, Mama. I have the signature right here. Then, you know, this is a... Um, my pastor, Rayford Owens, man, he found out what we was doing and he told us that we could come, we could come do it at the church. You feel what I'm saying? So what the church did was make breakfast for us and all that shit and a gang of different gangs from different hoods all over Bronx and shit came to the church and we met. And you know, my pastor, Rayford Owens, he's a sheriff, he a cop sheriff too, so you know, and he's the motherfucker that's in some. You know, he, he basically, he in the front, he in the front for, for Compton, basically, in the front for for Compton. He, he trying to make the city a, a way better place, so he was down for it, for sure, for sure down for it, man. He be getting all type of awards and shit, but it should be doing about the Ready for the man. So this is at the church right here. He definitely I cried. Oh, I cried like a baby. Like a baby on that. Once you heard about it, what were the thought process going on in your head? Like, how did you, could you ever imagine it? No. Getting to that? No. Hell no. No. I couldn't have never imagined. She, well, my she son. come from, she come no. from here in shots outside and going no. to my room, right? Let me and it's a pillow, but in the shape of my body. She I from walked that in his shit. room with him. Um, <laughs> I heard gunshots one night. And I ran to his room to see if he was okay, and he's jumping through the window. So, yeah, you know, for, for that right there, to go to the newspaper, that was yeah. epic. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? That, that was something that you could never believe that was going to happen. Mm -hmm. You know. Remember you had to come get me from jail, too? <laughs> what time? That time when the Chinese people jumped me, oh, yeah. was still in that car. And he telling me, they got me. Oh, they jumped me. He was real dramatic on the phone. He was very dramatic on the phone. And I'm like, what? Where are you? Where are you? So he tell me where he at. And I'm coming from Compton. I have to go all the way up on Washington somewhere. Up in L.A. I don't to, know to where I'm station. going. To the police station. I was a juvenile, so they let me go. But I end up having Thank to, God that it was a Hispanic, um, Hispanic um, detective. And he was flirting with me. He wanted to take me out. So I played the role until I got my baby out of that place. So I got good grades too. <laughs> my teacher's trying to play with her. I used to think she was my big sister. You know, so yeah, but that helped a lot too. I had to go to camp. It's a, like, imagine like, how did you feel that, the, all right, this is what we have to do. We have to go to court for that shit, right? How many times did we go to court before... Maybe about three or four times. Then after they, that, they, they, they nine give, months, six nine months. Then they give your son the time in the courtroom. And now you gotta hug my, your son. My world was crushed. And then you go to that like, other where door. Does this you ain't going to the exit door. You going to the door. So they about to take you to camp in juvenile hall. You know what I mean? And I'm saying to myself, where did I go wrong? Yeah, because you you blamed yourself. When you ain't supposed to blame yourself though. Now that I'm a daddy, I blame myself for some things, but it ain't got nothing to do with the parents, man. The kids go do what they do. Is that something, is that some feedback that you actually heard? Like people were, 
were uh, upset with you for for doing that? Um, it was a it was a couple of little homies. They they wasn't upset, but they they wasn't with it. Gotcha. You feel what I'm saying? So I got it to the point to where they was like, okay, well, nigga love you, nigga nigga go respect what you talking about. So if they stay on their side, if we stay on our side, we can just leave it at that. That's what we did. They stayed on their side, we stayed on our side until it, it was good until lines got crossed. Once line got crossed, I'm out of it. Nigga was back on. Mm. But for a minute, nigga, the, the, uh, the murder rate in the city went down for a minute. Hey, Avenue. Me and Big Zoe, you know, we had a, a, a meeting with a gang of uh, all the hoods up in Bompton and shit. Niggas was in there and, you know, niggas said they side, said how they felt. At the end of the day, the best the best thing was for everybody to just, you stayed over there, I stay over here. You know what I mean? We ain't gotta, uh, we ain't gotta uh, be on no kumbaya shit. We ain't gotta be friends. We ain't gotta be getting drunk with each other. We ain't doing none of that shit. But you just stay over there. Y'all stay at y'all 7-Elevens. We stay out our 7-Elevens and gas stations. And leave it at that. And it, um, you know, they put, they put a nigga on the front page of the news for that shit, too. The newspaper, LA Times. What was that like at the time? Did you feel like a lot of pressure was on you? Um, in a sense, it was rewarding. In a sense, it was rewarding. Why is that? In half a mile, turn once left it, onto East Compton Boulevard. Because once it got big like that, everybody was more so clapping gotcha. about what a nigga did. What about in the beginning stages before? Yeah, I was back, it was back last, it was niggas running their mouth about this and that. You know, niggas running mouth, but they ain't gonna tell you in your face. We supposed to get ourselves together first before we go get ourselves together with no cribs. What you mean, get ourselves together? What, pyro, pyro? We, we don't beef with no pyro. What the fuck you talking about? Mm-hmm. We the originators, nigga. We don't beef with no pyro. What the fuck you? What you mean? I don't know. I don't know. They was, but that, that's, that's what happened. The back, that's what happened. At the Shit line. didn't mean Turn left yeah. onto East Compton Boulevard. The purpose was much bigger. Yeah, it didn't mean nothing to me. I knew the back bicycle was going to come, but the thing is, the purpose was much greater. And I knew if anybody can do it, I can do it. Mm-hmm. And I probably regret it if I didn't do it. And then the shit that uh, ended up happening after that, not doing it. You feel what I'm saying? As far as losing little homies that was close to me, losing niggas that I, I already lost niggas from uh, for the sandbox that was close to me. So I felt like I, I had to. I had to. Mm-hmm. I had to. And I did it, nigga. And then once the. Uh, you know, once the once the, uh, the motherfuckers started filming me and shit about it, or people came to do from interviews, motherfuckers from France and shit came to do interviews and all the you know the newspaper did all that shit. It was more of a praise after that though. Yeah, you had That's to put just, in the work. You had to put in the work though. Miles. And I knew Turn number right one. Avenue. I knew the number one thing that people were gonna say. They were gonna say, uh, "How you expect us to kill our drama with our hood?" You ain't did it with your, with your enemies. So we had to make sure that we called niggas over that I didn't get along with. And that was real enemies. And they came to our park. Niggas from Swamps or whatever came to our park. And niggas hollered, you know, hashed out what they hashed out. Started with us first. And then it trickled down to different hoods. You know, uh, the mob and the, the, uh, the looters came to a meeting. You know, but um, you said uh, I mean it was effective at first. I mean, but you know, it's it's, it's all back on now. It's keeping it one hundred, but it was effective for a little while. And that's all that matters. So. The things that you have been through in your own life, did they ever come up in your thoughts when you met at the park, or was all that just out of your head and you were just thinking about the future at this point? I had to put what the fuck I done been through on the side for something that was bigger. I couldn't. I couldn't do it. I couldn't be on some man. Fuck this nigga. I'm mad, bro. I'm over here. I'm just weird. So I could. I couldn't do that. That's, it wasn't in me when I knew something was was bigger to happen or, or, or something that bigger to come out of the situation. I 
I couldn't be on a little weird shit. They ain't talking to that nigga. Fuck that nigga. I, I couldn't do that. I, that was not in me. Uh, I seen what was bigger, so that wasn't in me. And you started seeing the change in the city. What was that like? Yeah, it was, um, you know, I had talked to the pastor and, you know, and all that shit. And, you know, they, they honored the work and it was like, you know, the, the murder rate had dropped for a little minute. I'm not going to say for a long time, but for a little minute, you know, that when it th- within itself was, was a war, you know what I mean? Very important to me. Yeah, so then it became to the point to where, like, you know, like other motherfuckers were seeing what we was doing, and they was contacting me. And they wanted to kill the drama between, you know, whatever hood that they was, they was beefing with. So now the work is on you know, now it's like I had to keep going. Yeah. You know what I mean? I, uh, nigga couldn't stop there. Couldn't stop with the with the praises, the handshakes, and all that. The work had to continue for a little while. It's, has anything changed about your everyday life or motivations behind your actions or decisions since the last time we spoke? Just because of how much is going on since? Yeah, in a way, you know. Um, we had that last interview. You know, I still had a homie, Tiny West, that was alive. Man. You know, certain motherfuckers was alive. Man. You know, but, um, I'll say this. You know, a lot of people had that EDD money and shit. And the PPP loans and all that shit. Everybody had money at a point of time. Right now, most of those people fumbled the bag. Most of those people ain't got money no more, but guess what they got? They got guns. Because everybody bought guns when they did have money. So right now, it's, it ain't like it's, you know, a hood got some choppers and handguns or going to get some hood that got one or two handguns. All the wars is fair right now. Everybody got guns right now. Everybody. You know what I mean? And. All fuckers is getting smoked left and right, nigga. To the point, man, giving us that money seemed like it was a setup. The new motherfuckers, it seemed like they knew motherfuckers was gonna act the way that they act. It seemed like they knew motherfuckers was go, you know, motherfuckers that they never had 20, 40,000, nigga, acting the way that they act. You know, motherfuckers had that money and they was able to be the nigga. They was able to get pussy now. They was able to do for their family, do for, for their mama, do for their kids. So when you take that feeling away, nigga, it's chaos, nigga. That's why you see these fuck niggas running up on pregnant women with strollers and taking her purse. Nigga, fuck shit, nigga. That's why you see these niggas taking niggas' money but still smoking them when they come out their house. Just stupid ass shit right now, dog. So yeah, my perspective has changed. This nigga just fuck the streets. Just fuck what they got going on right now, man. Yeah, I stay low key. I stay doing my own thing. I stay minding my business. You know what I mean? I don't I don't walk around like I can't be touched. I don't walk around like if a nigga don't know where I stay at or no. So I don't walk around like that, nigga. I walk around paranoid, nigga. You can't tell I'm paranoid, but in my mind. I ain't no bad paranoid niggas gonna keep me alive. I know looking at my motherfucking mirrors everywhere I go is gonna keep me alive. I know when I go to the mother to, to my motherfucking house, before I get to my house, nigga, I'm gathering up everything that I'm gonna take when I get to, to the house and put it in the bag. So when I get to my motherfucking house, I'm not I'm not fiddling around and grabbing shit, nigga. I'm out the car and to the house, nigga. I'm not sitting in my car for nothing, cause that's when uh, sitting in your car is one of the most vulnerable, vulnerable places you can be. You know what I mean? So, hell yeah, nigga, everything has changed. Nigga, I'm triple down on coming home now. You know what I mean? Coming home, going out the house and coming home now is like an understatement. Like, it's, it's uh, cut 50% of you actually making it home. You know what I mean? A lot of, we lost a lot of good motherfuckers this year, dog. A lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of important people that you wouldn't think that we'll lose. You, you was a lot of motherfuckers that's 
smart just like I am, intelligent just like I am, move just like I am. You know what I mean? Still gone. You know what I mean? Oh so, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's hand on the swivel right now. It's hand on the swivel. What's up? What about in the way of progress? You know? No, ain't no progress right now. Living in the front, we had this routine that, you know, when the motherfuckers start shooting and shit, we all would get down and we would all meet up in the hallway. I mean, living in the front wasn't easy, man. That shit was rough as hell, man. It really was. See, as a child up there playing, riding on a bike, you got enemies doing weird shit. Like, I just see your sister on the bike, like, you know what I mean? Just like weird shit, dog. I forgot to ask you, how was it when you seen me on the ground that day? Oh, when we seen all uh, this uh, shit happen? It was like... After being shot in the neck. A dark cloud. She was five years old. And all I heard was the gunshots. And I knew he just went outside mm -hmm. because he was taking his camera to the shop. Because we had just not too long got back from Jamaica. We went to Jamaica. So he was taking his camera and somebody was coming to get him. But when he walked out immediately, <laughs> gunshots. And I ran to the door not thinking. She was five and she ran behind me and she was screaming and I was screaming, but I didn't want her to come out and I was pushing her back and the guy was standing over him shooting. His body was rolling. He was rolling back and forth. The dude hopped out and I, and I acted like I was pulling something. So I'm trying to act like I'm pulling something on my leg. He stopped and then he started shooting. So I'm dodging him, trying to pull something on my leg. And he was trying to pull something on my pocket, trying to bluff the nigga basically. And it low key worked because he didn't continue to get close. And once he seen me trying to pull something on my pocket, he started shooting, but he's backing up, and I'm dodging it, trying to pull something. He thinking he about to get hit with something. He went back to the car, then they drove off. I remember my mom coming outside while I was on the ground, because so I'm looking lifeless, really, because I'm laying there. All I just remember her saying, like, she dead! She yelled out, like, he dead! And I popped up. And then she knew I wasn't dead, but she knew I was still shot, you feel me? So that's when niggas came outside. Ran to the front and said, Nut told me he thought he thought I was dead because he was right there with me. Right and he there. ran, yeah. And he said that was the longest walk ever from hearing all them shots and then got to mm -hmm. come back up and see what the fuck did happen to him because he, you know, you remember me being right there. And then it was um, my, my baby mama's sister, she yeah. was getting some, she was about to pull up and grab some beat or some shit. And we picked you up and, put and me didn't in the know the girl. And he put him in the car and mm -hmm. was like, bitch, try. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he was mad. He was cussing everybody out on the way to the hospital. Yeah, so they take him to Gardena Memorial. I called my mom. And she went to Gardena Memorial. She like, get my grandson out this fucking hospital. You know, because I didn't know they didn't have no trauma unit. They don't have a trauma unit. So, so what they did was they sedated you, uh, him. And then took me to. Uh, and when they sedated him, he had tubes in him. So when you seen him, you didn't know what condition he was in. Remember, I was telling you that earlier. People thought I was dead, and that the people was lying yeah. because of the movie American Gangster when they put that nigga on the journey and opened yeah. his eyes, but he really was dead. So they thought that's what had happened. And the police pulled me over, thinking telling me that I could have been a shooter. And I'm explaining to them, that's my child. Why would I be shooting him? But the guys were on a high-speed chase, which they end up catching all three of them. They caught them that same day, um, somewhere on Wilmington and something, but they did catch them. But that right there, I had to go on Xanax. I'm not going to lie. Whoa. I was a nervous wreck. <laughs> I couldn't do 4th of July. I couldn't hear a loud noise. I had some Xanax, honey. 
Because I was literally a nervous wreck. They I put mean, her in the back of the car. Yeah, they too. put her in the back of the police car, and her dad came and he cussed Man, the police. That nigga Big Reg <laughs> told me the story. He said that nigga Big Bull pulled up to the apartments, seen the night in the car, and said, "Get my motherfucking daughter out this car." Now, yeah. but that nigga real say, man, you could have heard that nigga from there to fucking central. It was so loud, you feel me? Yeah. And they, the look that was on Big Boy's face, I don't know what it was. They did exactly that. They got her yeah. out the back of the car, and Red's like, like trying to take her to Big Boy. Yeah, because so they serious. had me pulled over on Compton Boulevard as if you know, I'm so upset and hysterical. I'm throwing up in the back of the police car. With because me and- yeah, with with her right there with me, it was me, her, and Rosie, because Rosie Carr got shot up. They fighting. Rosie and Rashard fighting somebody at the fucking hospital. I don't know. In the parking the, lot. I don't know who the fuck they didn't rush. <laughs> find me crazy. Man. But yeah, it was it was that that experience again alone. You know, it's like here we go. Like I don't even know this what what state of my son is in. I don't know, but. Thank God the bullets went in and out of the fatty tissues. Nothing stuck. Mm -hmm. So it went in and out. And it's, you know, just a line going down his back of the bug shots or whatever they said it was, you know. How was your experience standing in the front? Uh, It was was like a new story every day. <laughs> never like, a dull moment. It was never a dull moment. Like still to this day, like our family just everything we go through, everybody is just never a dull moment. For me, like my my memories is like like he said when it was like someone shooting in the front, mm-hmm. we run into the um oh. hallway. I remember going in the bathroom sometimes, mm-hmm. like in the tub, like mm-hmm. and I'm like five and you know, I still remember those things and it's like it programmed me to where I, when I hear shots, I know I automatically get on the floor. Like, still to this day, like, if I hear shots, I know to get on the floor. So, you know, and I just remember all the time, like, my mom would be so worried at nighttime, like, for my brother to be home. Like, I just remember being up with her, like, you know, everything she went through, because I was like, I stayed on her hips. I basically went through it too with her because, mm-hmm. you know, I was on her hip, I was young, so I never knew it, but, now that I'm older, I realize like everything she went through, I did too with her. So when she's up waiting on my brother, little did I know, I'm up waiting on him too. You know, I'm up wait, I'm waiting to see him every day like my mom is. You know, so that just was my I never experience. Sleeps. Yeah, I you never know. slept. How was it being boy and boogie little sister? <laughs> it's crazy because still to the day, <laughs> some people don't know that I'm both of y'all sister. Like. I remember going to an event with you guys, and it was like, wait a minute, you boy sister too? I'm like, yeah. And they're like, wait, they brothers? I'm like, yeah. Like, you didn't know that? Like, no, I didn't even know they had a sister. But I just know, it's just, <laughs> it's crazy having both of y'all as my brothers. Cause when one is up, <laughs> one <laughs> is down. Yeah, it's exactly. like, one temper is bad, the other one is trying to calm that temper. The other temper is up. This temper is down. It's like night and day. And it made it hard for me at school because, like, like me, my brother's just like a 14-year-old, 14 14-year 14 gap. So, like, you're in middle school, and then your brothers come up flossing, like, you know, the newest cars, beat, chains, you know, nice outfits. So all the kids is like, who are your brother? Like, you know, and I'm like, You're nobody. Right. That's like, that's just my brother. You know, kids always be like, oh, you got money. Like, let me borrow the $100. I'm like, I don't have $100. Like, I got $10 for the week. Like, <laughs> you know, like, they always be like, your brother's like, I seen your brother in the music video. Like, I seen your brother with Kendrick Lamar. Like, your brother is famous. Like, you know, and, I, and to me, I'm used to it. I'm like, they're not famous. Like, what are you talking about? But kids just love they, once they find out who my brothers are, they get so infatuated. Like, they see them and everything, and I have to hear about it. And I'm just like, whatever. Like, I was there. Like, what are you talking about? Like, you know? So, once people find out who my brothers are, it's like, it'd be like Hollywood in their eyes. Like, they just admire them. And then 
for me, it's like they gotta they gotta feel like they gotta protect me because if they don't, my brothers go come after them. Like you know, it's, it's not even that deep, but you know, they they be like your brothers is like you go the niggas like you know, <laughs> so that's how it is with both of them have like being my brothers. Like I just I'm so protected by people. Like people love to have me in their life as well because of them. So I just, I get extra love, you know, them being my brothers. And them two, they, they always got my back. So oh, really? these, these is my hero, both of them. You Yo, know, heroes. Yes. Oh. Especially oh. Rubber. He, he locked it down. Like, you know, Who's my rubber, rubber you got that's his that's nickname. <laughs> I've been calling him since I was little, rubber. He locked it down. I lost my father when I was 14. I think 15. One of those. I was in 10th grade. And my other brother, Bull, he's locked up. So he couldn't, he, he not here to step up, but he did. He, like, Boogie stepped up. He, he made sure I'm good. Like, even if it's $5, like, he send it $100, whatever I need, like, he's going to send it. And I hesitate because, you know, he's not my dad. But he, he, like, don't hesitate. Like, I'm your brother. Like, anything you need, you know, I'll give it to you. So. He really stepped up like a hero. Like I seen him change like over the years. Like it was a huge change. Like he he changed a whole lot. He went to a father figure like for me. Like huge. He changed. <laughs> and um, I'm always doing something different. And him and my mom and my auntie Amy like whatever I need, they get make sure I get it done. Even if tomorrow I could be wanting to be a painter, like they're gonna go buy a thousand dollar worth of stuff for me <laughs> to pursue that. And they always they always laugh at me like, Oh, today I wanna be a teacher like and they laugh and like, Whatever, what do you need? Like <laughs> you know, and they step up like I appreciate my brother, I appreciate my mom, like they they really stepped up for me, like my brother, he's really my hero, like he's he's done everything that I, I need. Like Aww. it doesn't matter. And I, I've seen a huge growth in him, a Man. huge growth, like. No, we just need a body fall. We need a body in the fall, bud. Gang, gang. What's up, P? What you want? West Side, Mellis. It's a ball room party. Say something to the camera. Another game, another game, another game, another game. Who else we got? We got Big Hill, though. Oh, damn. 